It's Their First, Their Last, where we take an inquisitive look at the very first and very last games for a famous gaming developer, publisher, machine or individual. And today it's Probe. And if you didn't know that name, you've certainly played some of the 123 games they had a credit on between 1984 and 1999. Most famously, they were THE conversion specialists of the early 90s. Sometimes to incredible effect. It was they who squeezed this version of Road Rash onto the Master System, coming damned close to the Mega Drive original. In the employ of Electronic Arts, they also got the gig to do several versions of FIFA 96. If you've played that on Game Boy, Game Gear, 32X, Saturn or even SNES, you were playing a pro game, not an EA one. Basically every home version of Mortal Kombat's 1 and 2, Master System and Game Gear Lemmings, home computer versions of Super Monaco, Outrun, Golden Axe, you name it, they probably ported it to something or other. But they also wrote their own original games, mostly for Ultima owners acclaim, and that will account for both their first and last releases. But you may also be aware of Die Hard Trilogy, Extreme G or Forsaken from their late era, or perhaps Jelly Boy or Hudson's interesting but ultimately pointless Virtual Soccer. Long before acclaim though, they self-published, and their first game was written by co-founder Varkis Paraskeva. Of the three games he was credited on, ignoring a credit for writing a high score table in Metrocross, the only one I'd heard of was The Adventures of Basildon Bond, licensed from, of all things, a comedy sketch on the Russ Abbott show. Two years before this though, Varkis and Probe made their debut with prison escape game Alcatraz, exclusively on the Commodore 64. So this is as simple as it comes. It's a platformer where you are quite literally attempting to escape Alcatraz. And unfortunately, they know you're trying to do it. And they're authorised to use lethal force. But let's be clear, only one lethal force at a time. Nor will they actually approach you. Also, they are using bullets that are slow enough to jump over. No wonder Sean Connery found this so easy. You'll hope to find it easy though, because the death noise is just awful. I'm not finding it easy, and that's not just because mapping the controls appeared to be hell. With that fixed, then you encounter a game from the old school. Ignoring my usual gripes about Commodore 64 colour, which is difficult here because the screen is literally 50% brown, then it actually looks pretty good for what is a very, very early game. It's reasonably responsive too, it is well programmed. The problem is in design, it's really strict. You have to be dead on jumping over bullets. But also, until I went and asked someone, it's so strict on the position for jumping down this hole, I wasn't even sure what I was supposed to do. Also, he's falling a good 10 feet here and he's fine, so that's the expectation you set. Then you get to the middle of the tunnel, and apparently a fall of about 10 centimetres will cause him to fatally roll his ankle or something. And while we're at it, where are those bullets coming from? Who is doing the shooting? It's screen 3 and I'm already save scumming to get through it, but once you do that this early section is okay. It's all a matter of timing and accurate jumping and I don't have a problem with that at all. Screen 4 is where I get stuck forever though. Ignoring what exactly has made this guy just fire off into the middle distance forever, there's no way to get through this section except timing and blind timing at that because you have no control over how fast or otherwise you take the elevator someone has very kindly installed in your escape hole which means you have to get to the top in between bullets, but enough in between bullets that you can then jump the next slot. Worse, you have to jump off the elevator because just riding it to the top appears to also kill you for reasons. All of these issues could be solved with platform stairs to get out. I can't do it. I've spent 30 minutes trying this. There appears to be no timing that lets me get through this. I know it's possible. There's footage elsewhere on YouTube of someone doing it but I can't even work out how he does it. That said, I'm mostly blaming this 1984 game for 1984 things. While its gameplay is aged like the C64 colour palette, I can see this appealing and it does provide clues to Probe's future. It's technically well, well above average, both visually and in control. My only problems with it are design ones really, and that's to be expected from a first product. I'm not sure I'd advise you to play it now for any reason other than to make me look bad, 
But there are absolutely glimpses here that Probe were not going to be a one and done software house. Flash forward a decade or so and the world and Probe are somewhat more corporate. Valkis appears to have long left, but the other founder, Fergus McGovern, is around to sell the company to long-term employers Acclaim. He left soon afterwards, and in 1999 Acclaim consolidates and the Probe name disappears to be replaced by Acclaim Studios London. We could look at the last game with the Probe name, which I think was Batman and Robin on PlayStation, given that studios that are incorporated like this tend to lose their identity rather quickly. But unfortunately Probe never got that chance. Their last game released under any name was only six months after they adopted the Studio London name, and it was their only game for Dreamcast. Radio Control Car Racer with a twist, Revolt, making its first Dreamcast appearance in Europe on the 17th of December 1999. Revolt is an interesting game which suffered in initial sales for me for the old the demo is too good reasons. It's a remote control car racing game, but unlike most games of this type, it ignores the top-down format of a Micro Machines, or even the real remote control viewpoint of something like the excellent RC to go. Instead, you've got what, on first impressions at least, could be a Mario Kart game. Although I mentioned Micro Machines for a reason, with its courses around the house that you could actually have pushed little cars around as a child. Coming a couple of years after the Micro Machines series went on something of a 32-bit era and beyond terminal decline, Revolt's immediate premise is one of growing up. Gone are tiny cars you pushed around yourself in the house, and here are electric and gas remote control cars you drive around the neighbourhood, and some slightly weird other places. The vehicle selection is as varied as that game too, everything from a default little racy RC car up to some actual G-Dang tanks all of which have their own properties, and of which there's a literal pile of boxes to unlock. In reality, the handling is like neither of those other games. It's very immediate. Despite being released exclusively on formats that very much supported analogue controls, it's so snappy that you might not even believe it to be so. This is going to be more of a problem later than it's going to seem on this Suburbia course, however. And it was this course with the full single race mode that comprised the demo I played very happily for way way too long. And that's because most of the game is here. You've got all the weapons, you've got enough of the cars, and there's a lot to this circuit. Much like Riker Machines, you can drive anywhere if you need. You can go under parked cars, you can leap off curbs, you can choose your own line off the construction site. The environment is, to a degree, your plaything. What the game doesn't appear to have, that virtually every single one of its peers has done before or since, is rubber banding. In many ways, this is lovely. I had a good run in this first race of the championship and I was able to control the race. My tactical use of some lucky electricity power-ups giving me enough of a lead that even this immense last corner crap-up didn't actually cost me the win. It does mean though that it's equally difficult to close up, as I proved by flashbacking to my first attempt at this race, which I spent 150 metres back from the field, and obviously way too far back for weapons to do much for me. Whether you prefer this will be up to you, but it does make Revolt a weird bundle of tropes ranging from full arcade to almost full sim at times. The physics model under here is actually really detailed. This is demonstrated very well by the second track, the supermarket for some reason, where part of the race is through a large walk-in freezer. The ice doesn't feel like someone at Probe just wrote grip equals no in the code. This is progressive, the line you take matters. You can use the crunchier snow around the outside as something of a barrier, and it's the one time you really feel analogue as you ease up on the power and sometimes do some incredibly wicked slides that do what every good arcade game should do, make you feel like an actual deity. Again despite practice it takes me a couple of attempts despite familiarity with the game. The handling is punishing, especially with these little cars, and the ability to use the surroundings means I probably should have been more ready for my ramp off these barriers. You never want to show all the game, which is good, because on a championship basis this is where I'm stuck for now. The museum level is frequently tight and claustrophobic, probably too much at least for this small car, so I'm going to have to experiment and I finished last a few times. It does though look cracking, not just for 1999 but for 2022. Yes, the Dreamcast has some inbuilt graphical effects, but the reflections on the shiny floors of the museums are almost ray tracy in their attractiveness and don't even consider knocking the Dreamcast off being locked to 60 frames a second. 
It was a bloody good machine, wasn't it? Probe was closed by acclaim without finishing another game in April 2000, but Revolt's story at least goes on a bit longer. In a clear out of the old Probe offices, they found files for the game's car editor and someone sneaked those onto the internet for everyone to play with. Also, if you looked very closely on a recent yesterzine that featured the initial 2002 promo video for Xbox Live, you'll notice it wasn't Halo they used to illustrate it. It wasn't Project Gotham or Rally Sport Challenge. It was Revolt. And a version of the game was issued to beta testers of the service, and I wish I knew what happened to mine because the game never made it to a full release. Acclaim themselves disappeared four years later, going out on a pile of uninteresting sports games. Probe at least went out on more of a high, even if their ports were always better than their original titles. Revolt at least outlived both companies. It maintained a dedicated fan presence. There was an updated version of Revolt in 2013 based on a community patch. It was released on GOG, and then unreleased on GOG when it turned out that WeGo Interactive, who bought the IP from the Smoking Ruins of Acclaim, had forgotten to actually ask anyone before using it. It's never resurfaced but a quick Google will certainly get you it. And it's worth playing. To celebrate a software house that were always low-key, but if you played games in the 90s, probably mean more to you than you thought.